leadership with their community leadership. So they have engaged in the community and many of them have, have basically started with very simple uh, activities in their local community. Some of them have knocked on doors, worked on a specific issue, and we'll get to hear about how exactly did they achieve the success. We are an innovation economy, which is powered by a lot of uh, activism behind, behind that. We, are, we, are, we have, amongst uh, our community, we have phenomenal uh, innovators. We have innovators, we have engineers who are going out there and bringing their good intentions into our Silicon Valley economy. But can we stop right there? Can we stop right there? Are we just innovators or are we also community members that need to get involved with everything going on in Silicon Valley? And I'll give you two good examples on this. The two examples that we have is uh, Proposition 47. Has anyone heard of Proposition 47? Proposition 47 basically has turned a lot of crime from felonies into misdemeanors, and that is impacting all our communities. As a result, we have break-ins that have gone a little rampant. So in Saratoga, if I look at the city that I live in, you know, our break-in has, has gone 2x compared to two years back. There is a significant growth in crime activities in the Bay Area. And Proposition 47, you know, all of us probably voted for it. I know, I remember that I voted for Proposition 47 back in 2012. And I voted in favor of it. But it leads to challenges now that we are all facing. It has led to a spike in crime. And also some of the uh, choices that the city of San Jose made a few years ago, uh, prior to this mayor, has led to some of the challenges that we have hit. You know, it started with San Jose and then it has trickled across the other parts of Bay Area. But, you know, there is a sensitivity to the growth of crime that, is, uh, that has resulted as, uh, as a result of that. Now when you look at, uh, I'll give you one more example. I'll give you one more example, and that is uh, SCA 5, State Constitutional Amendment 5. And that's the affirmative pro program that was, uh, uh, you know, there was a force behind it looking to see how we could bring it back. And that would impact how our students were given admission into the UCs, into the University of California system, you know, bringing affirm affirmative action back. And there was a hue and cry on it, and there were public rallies that were held in Cupertino. Is anyone familiar with SCA 5? Yeah, so the thing is, you know, all these things that are happening around us, they are going to impact us, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in terrible ways. So it's a question, you know, we, we can play sideline bas basketball and we can watch what's happening in front of us, or we can get engaged. The chances of us engaging and making something good happen is much more likely compared to playing sideline basketball and screaming and shouting at the refs, hey, you know, this is not foul. That's a foul play right there. Are the refs really listening? Not really. Because they have a game going on and either you play, participate in the game, or you step aside and let it happen. And my take is, and my take is we should all get involved because there is a price to pay when we are not involved. And that's the kind of discussion we would like to have. And uh, I'm delighted that we have, uh, we have Mayor Sam Licardo here. Is Mayor Sam Licardo here? Behind me, all right. So, uh, you know, phenomenal leader, and uh, he's led led to yes. Let's give him give up a big round of applause. <laughs> I did see him coming in from there, and then I lost him. So, uh, you know, Mayor, I, he's actually also I, I like him a little bit more because he's originally a Saratoga resident. Also, you know? <laughs> his parents still live in Saratoga, so he comes by once in a while, and he graces our city. But he's brought some incredible leadership in the city of San Jose. He's looking to make change happen. Many a conversation that I have with him, he's looking to for ideas, trying to adapt the high-tech playbook into making something happen for San Jose. You know, he's truly trying to make a difference, and I would like to have Sam, Sam step forward and deliver the keynote address for our panel here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Thank you very much. And Thank you all. You know, given the, 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 the caliber of people you have here on this panel, I'm not eager to talk long. I think you've got uh, great people to hear from as I look to my left and your right. What I just wanted to emphasize about what we're focused on is the long-term needs of our region. And all of us at all levels, as we think about uh, the role that, that Roe could play in Congress, uh, the role that Bob is playing in, uh, in Sacramento, all of us in our own roles, uh, Jim and I here locally, uh, we've got to be narrowly focused on ensuring that Silicon Valley continues to win a battle that we've been engaged in now for many years. And this is a battle with other metropolitan areas throughout the country, whether it's New York or Austin or Boston or any of the other areas that are particularly effective in moving forward with tech agendas. 
And these are not battles simply within our own nation, but in fact, a battle that is global. Uh, we're involved in this battle as well with Shanghai and Bangalore and every major metro area that has an ability to attract and grow talent. This is a war for talent. And we need to be the region that continues to attract talented people from all over the world to be able to push forward what we know is uh, the, the, what has become the most innovative region on the planet and the economic breadbasket for the rest of the country, if not the world. And the way that we're going to do it, I see it, is, is multifaceted. We need to continue to advocate the national level to ensure we have immigration policies that will ensure that people can freely come here, that the most talented among us have an opportunity to shine, that we're not cutting off opportunities for education for those who want to come here for that, uh, for that critical need, and we're ensuring that those who are educated here can continue to stay here and be entrepreneurs and grow jobs here. And uh, we all know there's a lot at stake here in November. Forgive me for being political for a moment, but I guess we're all politicians. Let me just suggest that building walls around our country is not a recipe for success in winning the war for talent. So I'll, I'll get off my pedestal there for a moment. Uh, so clearly we've got a lot to do at the national level, and, it, and each of us in our own levels certainly have a role to play in attracting and ensuring we continue to be a place that attracts talented people and is open to talent. Secondly, we need to focus on growing our own talent. And I think about the incredible initiative that, for example, Rishi has led here in San Jose and several other cities throughout the Bay Area about how we can engage more kids in coding in our libraries. Uh, you know, we launched a coding camp at Hillview Library in East San Jose. 200 kids showed up. They're fired up to get involved because they get it. Even if their parents don't quite understand it yet, they get it, they see the opportunity, they know it's something uh, that they can be passionate about, that they can be involved in, in creating. And then finally, we certainly need, it, it, I'm sorry, forgive me, on, on the issue of education, we have a lot of work to do, certainly, we know. At the state level, locally, here in San Jose, we've pushed hard to expand our library hours, ensure we're open six days a week now. We've worked hard to ensure uh, that we can relaunch after school programs once again, and we are now supporting those programs in 15 schools throughout the city, and we're gonna double that next year. Finally, what we need to do is continue to recognize the critical place that Silicon Valley has become. And we cannot continue to be the place that attracts talent if we just grow the way we have. What Silicon Valley really needs is an urban center. And certainly we have seen the, the, the gravitational pull from the north. Uh, we need to provide an urban, dynamic, vibrant place where the 20 and 30 somethings want to be, where they want to live, where they want to play. Because even though we have wonderful suburbs in this valley, even if the 27-year-olds who are driving innovation in many of our, our, our small tech companies could afford to live in those wonderful towns, and they can't, <laughs> they wouldn't choose to live in a beautiful suburban town because the suburbs are simply not attractive to the 20 and 30-somethings. We need to have a vibrant urban option. And certainly that starts here in downtown San Jose, but we need to be thinking differently about land use, about how we create density with transit. We have transit uh, is very much on the fore for us in November as we have a ballot measure coming here in Santa Clara County. We need to grow up as a city and as a region and recognize that if we do not become uh, a, a vibrant urban center, we will continue to lose talent to other centers that attract people who want to be where they can engage meaningfully uh, in, in social environment, uh, with entertainment, with culture and arts, and all those options that are viable and, and vibrant in great cities throughout the world. And so we look forward to working with you to create a vibrant urban center here in downtown San Jose and where we have opportunities throughout Silicon Valley and uh, to continue to be the place that attracts talent and grows talent here in our county. Thank you, Rishi, I appreciate the opportunity. So Sam is a busy man and he has to leave, but I, I will pose one question before, uh, and he's welcome to obviously stay, but we'll get through the introductions of the panel, but I would like to have one question for Sam. And the question is around our Silicon Valley innovation economy. You know, San Jose is setting the direction for the rest of the country. And so the question is, you know, as we, you know, as entrepreneurs, we are actually working pretty hard 
you know, there is a lot of zealousness in terms of taking ideas and turning that into a startup and turning that startup into a money-making uh, mechanism for a lot of citizens of Silicon Valley, right? I think it's proved very effective, very well for, to create an economy that is delivering riches to many of us in Silicon Valley and in the Bay Area. But in terms of our community engagement, sometimes we are very busy. We have dual income families. We have the husband and wives working. The kids are uh, running pretty hard, doing their robotics, doing their coders, and doing all that kind of stuff. But Sam, do you see our sense of involvement from the community? Or do you see a community spirit? Is that missing or can we do better? Would love to get your thoughts on that. Well, I think I see great examples of people getting deeply engaged in our community. I just mentioned one that you've led, Rishi, recently. Uh, but we can always do better. And one of the great challenges is our strength here in Silicon Valley. We come from all over the world. 40% of our residents in San Jose were born in a foreign country. That in many ways has been the secret sauce of our success throughout this region in Silicon Valley. At the same time, it means that people are coming from around the world and they may not be speaking the same languages. They may have, uh, there may be cultural obstacles we need to overcome. It may be that their, their first affinity when they think about where they want to give uh, particularly as we look at where foundation dollars are going in this region, uh, may tend to be at home in another country and not here locally. And so uh, we have a lot of work to do, I think, to build bridges. And our diversity certainly has been our strength. I think uh, it means we have a little more work to do to engage people meaningfully with a sense of place here. And certainly I look forward to, to working with many of you to make that happen here. Thank you, Sam. So what, what I will do quickly is, uh, you know, Sam, once again, a big round of applause for Sam. The mayor of San Jose, thank you for joining in and, and gracing our event. And uh, hopefully we'll back you, uh, have you back again and again. So let's do a quick round of introduction. I'm going to start with, do a quick hand wave, and then I'll, I'll get to questions. Because we have only like 90 minutes left, so we'll run through this. Actually, it's more like 60 minutes. So we'll start with uh, Sunnyvale Council member, Jim Davis. Let's give it up for Jim. And we have the Vice Mayor from East Palo Alto, Larry Moody. Let's give it up for Larry. We have the Vice Mayor from Daly City, and he's running for office. Just Google to find out what. But uh, here is uh, David Knappa. And we have a congressional candidate, Ro Khanna, who is the former uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Department of Commerce. Did I get it right? Yes. Super. Thank you. Uh, I mean, he's served in Washington, D.C., and he brings a lot of great experience and leadership to our economy here, you know. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we have Senator Wikowski, a former uh, council member, vice mayor of uh, Fremont. But he's been serving as a senator and doing some phenomenal leadership, bringing that to that East Bay area. So thank you for joining us, Senator Wikowski. And then we have uh, Vice Mayor Lily May from the city of Fremont. And then here we have the mayor of Fremont. Yes, Bill Harrison. How are you? Good to see you. Please join us. Perfect timing. Look at that. We mentioned Fremont, and here is Bill. And then we have an activist from Fremont. That's Mahesh Pakala. He's done some phenomenal activities out there in Fremont, and he still continues to engage locally in helping out in many, many different ways. Great to have Mahesh. And then we have Assembly Member Kansan Chu. Former council member from San Jose, and you know he's gone up the rung. You know he's climbing the rung of the political leadership because he is contributing in a huge way, and that's why he got elected unopposed uh, when he ran for re-election as an assembly member. So great, good to have Kansan's leadership. And then anything good that happens from Kansan happens because of his wife Daisy sitting next to him. Let's give it up the lo the loudest applause for Daisy. OK, so the mic is right there, and we'll get going from there, that end. And, and I'll, I'll, we'll run through a question. So I'm going to introduce my interns here. We have Santosh and Krina. Stand up. Yes, let's, let's thank them, because they are our timekeepers today. And, and what I told them, and I'll just state it the way I said it. I said there are a bunch of politicians here, and they never stop talking. Except me. <laughs> so and, and nobody applauded on that. <laughs> But it's the truth. It's the truth. So that's why we have a timekeeper. So the first question is two minutes. And the remaining questions is three minutes. And you will see them flashing. So please keep an eye on them. And if you are really compelled to finish what you're saying, please continue, continue on. But we would like to see, hopefully, everybody gets through. We have a fairly extensive panel. As you can see, we have one, two, three, four tables, right? So we'll get through it. So the, question, the first question is, 
Uh, as a, by way of introduction, I would like to hear, starting with Kansen uh, over there, in terms of uh, you know, what's your agenda on your political role that you have today? You know, what's your agenda? And if you can say it in like one or two lines, and like for example, and I'll give you an example, I call myself providing services cheaper, faster, better to Saratoga, and then everything falls under that umbrella. So you know, what's that one or two things that you seek to do as a political leader? And then an example of that, you know, an accomplishment that you're really very happy about that you get excited about that sets you on the path of political leadership and you aspire for doing more and more. So we'd love to start with Kansen on that. Great. Well, thank you, thank you very much um, for having me here. Um, does this mic work? Okay, I just probably move it closer to my mouth. Um, and again, uh, my name is Kansen Chu. Um, I'm currently sitting on the uh, state assembly representing North San Jose, Milpitas, Fremont, Newark, and Santa Clara. And before that, I served at uh, two terms in the San Jose City Council. Um, but prior to serving on the San Jose City Council, I served on the various uh, school board for, uh, for two, uh, close to two terms. Um, I, I think I'd like to start off with my beginning. I came to the United States as a graduate student. And after I got my master's degree in electronic engineering, I moved to uh, San Jose in 1978, working on IBM for 18 years. So, uh, and, and then gradually uh, get, getting into the public uh, service, service arena. And I start out by uh, volunteer on my time in many of the local board and commissions and I will serve on the mental health board and also the private industry council, which is to help people with dis dislocated uh, 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 jobs and also uh, 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 children with, uh, um, uh, with some, some challenges in, in their life. And as a, a San Jose City Council member, I focus my effort in the local quality of life issues and uh, uh, land use issues, and was very proud to uh, head the uh, task force to develop the North San Jose Neighborhood Plan. I know now it's in implementation and is um, uh, uh, growing, like uh, becoming the fastest growing area in the Silicon Valley. Uh, the, um, I, I can't read it, well, how many, 15 seconds I have? Oh, time, time is up, okay. On the uh, as, as state assembly, I'm focusing on transportation issues in the Bay Area. Thank you very much again for having me here. Hi, my name is Mahesh Pakala. Uh, I'm really humbled to be sitting with such powerful people next, right, on the right and the left. I'm a small community, uh, community activist and uh, Myself and Rena actually have been working on the Indian American mobilization team for Ro Khanna's campaign for the US Congress. My family has known Ro Khanna for a long time. So today, but I'll be talking in general terms about the Indian American mobilization in the Silicon Valley. So when I moved into the Silicon Valley 25 years ago, we had less than 100,000 Indian Americans. Today we have more than 600,000. So we need a fair representation. That's my, the team's ja role. So the team, actually we have a very large team uh, I just want to make sure I don't miss any names. This one is definitely our fearless leader, Dr. Ramesh Japra. Then we have Rahul, Anil Yadav, Chandruji, Yogi Chok, uh, Chandrasekhar Ji, Maya, Vijay Chawa, Prasad Gutta, Mahesh Nialini, and Ram Gopal, Anu Ganguly, and many, many other people. That's our role, is to mobilize the Indian Americans. Why? You know why, because we don't have a fair representation as yet. So. Our, what we have been doing over the last four, and five, four to five years is we have been supporting very well-qualified Indian American candidates, and if not, any other candidate who we feel will do uh, good for the Indian American community. So also we want to build good South Asian uh, political leaders, create, and create self-confidence to be proud of the faith and root to set a high, stand, high bar in the US politics. And the fourth thing that we are looking at is activating and engaging South Asian voters to go out and vote. So, and I, as we have seen the last few uh, couple of years, the results are there. So I'll be talking, actually, I don't want to, I have a speech after this 
panel, we have a talk about how we have been able to mobilize the Indian Americans, and we have been seeing some great results. So we will talk about the results as well. And that's all for now. We we'll talk about it later. Thank, Thank you, you, Mahesh. This is kind of like the presidential debate where the candidate completely skips the question. <laughs> <laughs> but well done. We'll go to Lily. I pass my message. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lily May, and I'm currently the vice mayor for Fremont, and I'm a candidate for mayor. Um, I think if there is something that I've heard overwhelming today is the discussion about having a voice. And so for me, I think to provide a voice for my community. And just looking at this panel, um, first off, I think as a woman, and I think the eighth woman elected in Fremont, I think that's very important, in particular also for minority women. I want my daughter and other young women to see role models in the community. Um, the other topic that we talked about was engagement and how can we get people engaged. I know Sam talked about that. Um, and so whether it's with education, and I'm proud to be the first school board member ever in my city to have crossed and joined the city council. Because I think that, that engagement begins from the beginning, that you need to educate the youth and empower them. So I'm very proud that in all my campaigns and working with the students and community that we continue this type of outreach. I formerly was a school board member um, in Fremont Unified, and I also was the state president for the Asian School Board Members Association for California. And during that time period, I worked very closely with the other minority caucuses. When we talk about creating a voice, it's not just about our community, it's about how we bridge and engage other communities to do the same, and how we can help each other grow successfully. The other thing that I think is very important for me is um, the business aspects. And I come from a background of technology. So formerly, I was a worldwide sales controller for a technology company. And during that time period, I ran a trade association, which represented companies globally and also looking at innovation and how they work on technologies that enhance their cities, their infrastructure, and their education, not just here in the United States, but in Europe and Asia. And so those types of knowledges help me right now as the vice mayor to engage people such as the Minister of Technology from Andhra Pradesh, um, the mayor from Taipei. So we've had these discussions and we have these smarter city panels and it allows us to be better effective in communicating our value add as a um, community here in Silicon Valley and here in Fremont. So I did want to add, you know, Lil Lily is actually representing, um, you know, the, the, the female species, right? I mean, she is there representing, the thing is we invited, we invited many, many women leaders from Silicon Valley, invited Cindy Chavez, we invited uh, Magdalena Carrasco, and many, many others. And unfortunately, they had a conflict today on a, on a Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning. So it, it, they couldn't make it. But you know, I think we will have many more women leaders because it's very important for us to have that. And Hillary has basically uh, uh, hopefully opened up doors for many other women. Having that nomination clinched has been, uh, you know, they call it shattering the glass ceiling of sorts. But hopefully we have many, many more of you that will go out and be in public office because we need many, many more women leaders in office. Go on to Senator Wikowski. Yes, I'm Bob Wykowski. I'm California State Senator, and I guess one of my umbrellas in public policy or, or sound public policy, as we're discussing today, is uh, we've called it economic equality and financial stability. Many of you have listened to the president talk about income inequality. So how have I tried to fashion legislation to help out, I guess I would call it the common person or the common, the common woman, try to... Uh, Create, have some financial stability because that's a big challenge for people right now, not only in Silicon Valley, but throughout the state. Many people outside of the, uh, the Bay Area feel like we're the promised land where the good jobs are at and they have to drive in from uh, Modesto. One of the challenges we ha I have is, you know, it's, it's, you want to have input from constituents and, and I'm, find myself reminding my colleagues to make sure that they represent their, uh, their, their constituents because there's in, whether you're in Washington DC or the city or in Sacramento, there's a lot of financial interests that come in that want to, want to be persuasive to have, to have their way. And it's trying to strike that right balance. So I've put together a series of uh, bills we'll talk about later that I think address this, uh, economic equity and financial stability. <laughs> it's good. I'm uh, Ro Khanna. I just want to first uh, thank Rishi. Uh, Rishi has just had such unbounded enthusiasm. He's everywhere in Silicon Valley. So let's give him a round of applause for his leadership. And just a few other folks that, of course, Dr. Jokbra and uh, 
uh, Rajesh Verma, Yogi Chog, Rina, and Mahesh, who have really, uh, from the beginning, uh, cared about the empowerment of the Indian American community. And while we have such a distinguished panel, I did want to single out Senator or Assembly Member uh, Kansen Chu and Daisy Chu. Uh, I don't think any two elected officials have done more uh, to empower uh, the Indian American community than those two people. So thank you. When we look at the calling of uh, what I think is important uh, in, in political engagement, and Senator Wykowski touched on this, you have extraordinary dislocation that technology and automation is creating for uh, certain types of jobs. You have a lack of diversity in tech companies, not enough uh, representation of Latino, African Americans. You have a shrinking pressure of the middle class. And I think from this district, from Silicon Valley, we have the tools, we have the expertise, we have the vision to help the country deal with the transition of automation and globalization and figure out how we create pathways for people to have a successful future. So to me, it's not about the Indian American community needing representation. It's about the opportunity for the Indian American community to contribute to the country so that we're successful and have a strong middle class in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Canapa. I'm the uh, current vice mayor of Daly City and a candidate for the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. First, let me thank uh, Rishi for, for inviting me. And first, let me thank the, second, let me thank the, uh, the press for, for covering this. Um, I, and Rishi asked a very important question. I think what I'm specifically focused on is uh, people-focused government. And so I've been on the city council for about eight years now, and it's the nuts and bolts. And I think when you're dealing with uh, local government. Uh, local government is predicated on have you, you know, have you, I have garbage on my street. Can, can you pick it up? Or, you know what, I'm having an issue with um, the infrastructure not being repaired. And so I take this simple notion of people focused government and see how we can deliver the best services um, to our residents. And I think that's what drives me every day. I think in addition to that, while Daly City is not in Silicon Valley, we did something rather um, revolutionary, actually the first city um, in both San Francisco and San Mateo County to do, and is to deal with um, issues around Craigslist. And so there are issues of um, online ads. Uh, people in our city, one of our residents was murdered over a Sony PlayStation. One of our residents, uh, nine of our residents were robbed uh, because of fake online ads. And what we did that was rather innovative is we created um, an internet safe sale exchange zone. And what this zone did basically is it allows people um, in our police department parking lot to make, um, you know, the seller and buyer, they can make um, their sale, whatever, with it. let's say it's a PlayStation, they could do it in a location with our parking lot, which is safer, and we have HD cameras. So these are sort of um, my ideas uh, when it comes to, to government. But every day, um, I love my job and I love the opportunity uh, to serve others. So it's, it's great to be in front of you. Uh, today and I thank you very much. Yeah, good job, David. <laughs> Larry Moody, I'm with the city of East Palo Alto where I serve as the vice mayor. Um, my story is, as the day goes through, might be a little bit different from many of the other panelists today. Uh, East Palo Alto is a small community right in the heart of Silicon Valley. We're 32 years old in existence. And we have the highest poverty indicators in San Mateo County around education, um, around uh, income levels, the barriers of housing and transportation. So when you begin thinking about how to serve others, you can always come to the community of East Palo Alto, like Reshia has done, right, to find ways to become engaged. One of the things that your community has absolutely prioritized is education. And education is certainly a core value for your community. Well, in East Palo Alto, that's a value for us as well. But we haven't done a good job of it because of many of the poverty indicators that I spoke of. We have a large immigrant population there. Uh, our total population is, is listed at 28,000, but we know we have about an additional 6,000 undocumented individuals in our community. The interesting thing about our community is our resolve. 
In the past 32 years, we have made a commitment to brand East Palo Alto as a community of relevancy. And we're still engaged in that task today. As people pass through our community as they're on their way to Apple, Google, Stanford University, to the two major airports, or to land over at Facebook, they oftentimes pass through our community. So our theme and our approach as a community is to become relevant to the strategies of Silicon Valley. And as we go on along during the course of our discussions today, I'll, I'll expound more upon that. But thank you for being, allowing me to be a part. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Jim Davis. I'm a council member for the city of Sunnyvale. And over the past five years and during my first term, I think that the two things that I've been able to accomplish that really stand out is that we've established a cold winter shelter for our homeless population in the North County. Uh, we don't realize it uh, because a lot of times we'll go home, we'll have a place to sleep and eat, but there are over 2,000 people in the north part of the, part of the county that go homeless and unsheltered every night. The second thing that uh, I spearheaded was the minimum wage. Uh, we realized uh, long ago that the economy uh, was moving richer people up and poorer people down. And in an effort to start to equalize that movement, uh, Sunnyvale was a uh, uh, person in the forefront just after our friends in San Jose, uh, where we've moved our minimum wage down to $11 and we'll be at uh, $15 by 2018. In the next uh, four years, in my, uh, if I'm reelected, I've got three things that you know, I want to accomplish. Number one is we have a terrible problem with traffic. And we've got to find solutions uh, for the traffic problems, you know, going up and down our freeways, our county expressways, on our rail transportation, our buses. And so I've been proposing an above ground rail transportation uh, that's on demand and gets the person to their, their final destination. Uh, the second thing that uh, I'm concerned about is affordable housing. Uh, Santa Clara County has got an affordable housing bond that's coming on the November ballot, and I'm supporting that. And the final uh, thing that I'm working very hard Hard on is bringing our public safety department back from uh, where we had to make uh, numerous cuts so that we can fight the crime and the uh, the property crime that has increased in our community. So with that, I'll pass it on to my good friend, Bill. Well, thank you. I, I, I first want to apologize for being late. I, uh, we're having our Festival of the Arts this weekend in Fremont. So we have uh, several hundred thousand people enjoying it. I had to be there with them today, and I'm going to go back and change so I don't look like a nerd walking the streets in a suit and tie. But uh, I also got to exchange a few words with Mayor Licardo on the way out. We can't have two mayors in one place at one time, I guess. But Exactly. But but to Rishi and Yogi and Dr. Japper and all the organizers, thank you for getting us uh, together. Uh, I think I remember the question that seemed so long ago, but uh, I, I told people I got involved uh, in politics because for a very selfish reason. I want my kids to grow up in a great city like I did. I, I was born and raised in Fremont, and I've seen Fremont change over those uh, nearly 47 years uh, that I've been there. A lot for the good and some for the bad. And we have challenges coming forward. Uh, when I graduated from high school, unless I wanted to work at General Motors or NUMI, there weren't really any other job opportunities in Fremont. As mayor, I focused on making sure we're building a 21st century economy. So when my kids graduate college and come back home, there's a place for them to live, there's a place for them to work, and there's a place for them to be part of the community. Uh, we are an inclusive place in Fremont. We have a very diverse uh, um cultural and, and uh, every culture you can think of, we're there in Fremont. We are what California will look like in 25 years, and we are what our nation will look like in probably 50 years. And I think it's important that people uh, realize that and make sure that Fremont is a place where we can all come together to celebrate the diversity, to celebrate the culture, and at the same point, be very relevant in Silicon Valley as we continue to be a, a hot spot in clean tech, a hot spot in biotech, and a hot spot in advanced manufacturing. And I'll leave you th with this one thought. For every one advanced manufacturing job created, there is an additional 2.3 jobs created by, by that. And I have 10 seconds left, so I'm going to tell my friend from East Palo Alto, they're not just passing through. I think my wife is solely keeping IKEA running because we are, for like the third time, redecorating with IKEA. So thank you for bringing, thank you for for, we, we are bringing our tax dollars to our friends in East Palo Alto. So thank you very much to the organizers. Look forward to the discussion today. 
and I get the pleasure of introducing my good friend, Ash Galera. <laughs> and perfect timing by Ash. Look at that. Yeah. You know, his turn to speak, and you know. here he is. Look at that. He he's the man who can be in two yeah. places at the same time. I'm not kidding you. Just in he's like delivery. like Flash. Yeah, you know, right. the, the Marvel comic character Flash. He can be here. He can be somewhere else. Phenomenal guy. But I wanted to thank uh, Mayor Harrison to, for for joining us today in a phenomenal leadership for Fremont that is setting the path for the Bay Area. So thank you. And uh, with, uh, you know, I, I, with Arsh, I'm going to redefine the question because Arsh was not here. The, the, we are talking about basically an introduction. And the introduction is geared around, you know, how would you uh, define, you know, your role as a political leader? What are you looking to achieve in like two or three lines? And then uh, an example of what you have uh, mm -hmm. contributed to the local economy or in terms of community le leadership, anything that you would like to highlight to our audience that will provide some context to knowing who that person Ash Kalra is. Well, thank you, and, th and thank you for inviting me, being here in San Jose. I, I walked past the mayor as I was walking in here. <laughs> and so we have a rule we can more than one of us at one time on a panel. And so, uh, did he? <laughs> I Man, I said not two mayors at one time. That's okay, okay, okay. <laughs> well, the San Jose proxy. Yeah, okay, <laughs> fine, fine. But uh, man, politicians really think alike, don't we? Yeah. Anyway, um, but you know, I, in terms of my political life, you know, it was never meant to happen. It, it, it was, and I think that's the case with many folks that end up in political in the political world. I just chose to serve, and, and I've been lucky because I do think. Um, I do think it's a blessing to be able to serve. Uh, and not everyone has the opportunity, not everyone, not everyone um, has the luxury, frankly. Uh, you know, they're, they're working to keep food on the table, what have you. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a family that supported me to allow me to choose what it is I wanted to do with my life. And service is always, uh, has always been the core of that. And so, you know, being able to work as a public defender for 11 years in the community in which I grew up, and now being able to represent the neighborhood and, and the community in which I grew up for uh, almost eight years now. Um, it, it's, it's been an, a feeling of, of empowerment, not just the ability to empower others, but I've felt very empowered through it uh, in terms of being a voice uh, for our community. And in terms, of, in terms of what, I mean, it's hard to identify one thing I've done or what have you, but I think what makes me proud um, of the work that my office has done is the, the, the way that we've activated neighborhoods, we've activated communities at the ground level. Uh, we, we've gotten people engaged and gotten neighbors engaged uh, that never even cared or knew what the city was up to. And now they have a strong voice. We've more than doubled the number of neighborhood associations that are active in my council district. And, and the reason why that is a source of pride, not maybe some policy that I may have enacted or things that some of us have done together in the community that have been uh, certainly powerful, is that when I'm long gone, that's still gonna be there. Uh, once you empower someone, once you empower a neighborhood, empower a community, that doesn't go away. And so uh, you know, I feel good that we've been able to do that through the work of my office. And, and um, you know, I'm always gonna do whatever I can to help serve our community, uh, no matter whether I have a title in front of my name or not. So I think, uh, you know, phenomenal community leaders and the common thread was, I think these folks really enjoy that. You know, community service can be very painful. It's a thankless job. Folks sometimes uh, calling, yelling and screaming over things not done. But you have to really, really enjoy. And, and many of these folks, you know, this is not a full-time gig. It's a, it's a part-time gig. They are funding their mortgage with a day job, right? So it takes serious passion, serious commitment. And more than anything else, you enjoy what you do as community leaders, community service. So I think they deserve a round of applause here. Let's give it up for them. OK, so um, you know, uh, I would like to call out a few folks who were going to be here but are not here. So we had uh, the California State Treasurer, John Chung. You know, he had initially committed to be here, and then he had to leave for a tour of uh, China. You know, he was invited uh, to meet one of the governors there. It was a delegation that was heading out. So unfortunately, he had a tough choice. And uh, so he was not able to make, uh, make it here with us. We also have Mayor Jose Estevez. And I keep looking at the door to see if uh, Mayor Jose Estevez, once he's, uh, you know, obviously there's something going on, but he's not able to make it. And then we have a former council member of Fremont, Raj Salwan, who had a serious case of stomach uh, food poisoning or something. So he's not able to be here. And then I 
believe uh, we have, uh, I think, everyone else. And, and uh, we are also missing out on uh, Mayor uh, Laura Hoffmaster from, uh, from Concord. So she's also not able, something came up last minute, it looks like. But we'll keep going. The mic is right here with Ash, and we'll go on to the next question. Now, uh, Ash, uh, the timekeepers, come on, please uh, wave one more time. Please wave one more time. And, and please be a little bit diligent about flashing the, ti the time sheet, whatever you have, because we, we are almost out of time. We only have about 45 minutes left, and we have to run through it in about three minutes for each question, right? And so elected, elected officials kind of sometimes ignore the timekeeper unless you're really, yes. you know, so. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ne next year we'll probably get one of those, you know, like uh, mega mega phones or something. <laughs> to yeah. so so now what we'll do is the next question. Let's go on to that. And the question is around the Silicon Valley innovation economy, right? Many of us are participating in there, and uh, you know, obviously our Asian American community is completely invested. Many of us have uh, are exactly in that profession, making a living, right? Many of us, but. Uh, now we have an economy which is basically a dual income family economy where the husband and the wife are both working because to pay that mortgage, you need two incomes. It's becoming very, very hard out here. And I still call it like my wife and I both work in the high tech and we are still below the poverty line. That's the way it is. You know, you're still working pretty hard to make ends meet. It's tough, right? And then how do you find the time and commitment to get out there and engage in the community and, and, and get involved with let's say a school issue that we have or a water issue we have, or a crime safety challenge that we have here. Where do we find the time and energy to do that? So, so the question is, are we doing enough as high-tech innovators here in Silicon Valley? Can our community do something different? You know, what is that thing that we should be doing? So we'd love to get your thoughts, and I'm happy to repeat the question as we go down the line. You know, it's a lot of uh, folks here on the panel, but I'm happy to repeat the question if we need to, and I might have forgotten the question too, but we'll get to that. Well, I, I, no, I don't think high tech is doing enough, but I don't think it's just to high tech. I don't think anyone, all of us are doing enough. I think that all industries, everyone needs to be engaged because uh, we certainly have here in San Jose, as much as anywhere else, a tale of two cities. Uh, we have, we've done a lot in this city. Mayor Locardo was here, may have spoken to it in terms of encouraging and growing our innovation economy. And it's going really, really well. It's going well in Fremont, so many other cities uh, in Silicon Valley and throughout the Bay Area. But with that, we're also seeing a lot of people are being left out. A lot of families are being left out. There are families, communities in my district, neighborhoods in my district, we have two, three families living in a home. And, and that's not acceptable. That's not sustainable. And that's not the kind of community any of us wants to build. And so I, I do think there's more that all of us can do. And I do think the tech sector is uniquely situated, both in terms of coming up with innovative ideas, but also with the wealth that's being created. It's not just, you know, you, it's not one or the other. You can have a great idea, and if you don't have the resources to implement it, nothing happens. You can have all the money in the world. If you don't have a great, uh, the right idea, then the money just goes down the drain, and you don't end up making the change you want. But those two, with that combination that Silicon Valley has right now, with the great minds and the resources, working with government partners, I think the sky is the limit. But we have to commit to it, and we have to have both the political will and the private sector will to make it happen. Thank you. And, and I, I kind of heard two, two parts of the question, so I you know, I try to just address them both. You know, the first part, I think, goes with community engagement and, and, and are we doing enough as a city, as a state, as a county to engage people? And I, I think the answer to that's always going to be no. You're never engaging everything. You know, we we don't have a, a true democracy. We have a representative democracy where people, because they're working two jobs, they can't afford to go to every city council. I mean, they can't afford to read everything. So we need to take the issues to them. And that's actually what I was doing this morning. We were at the Festival of the Arts where there's tens of thousands of people telling them about our innovation economy that we're building around the new South Fremont Warm Springs BART station, telling them about our downtown, asking them questions, hearing their questions about transportation and development, all that stuff. So we have found our best resource is rather than waiting for people to come to us, we go to them. We go where there's large gatherings. We have a street eats program where there's food truck uh, coming every Friday night. We're making sure the city of Fremont is down there representing and talking to the people there to make sure that we're engaging with our citizens because, uh, like you said, people are working two jobs. They're shuffling their kids between soccer practice, piano lesson, lessons, and language lessons. They don't have time to engage. So we have to be there to make sure we can hear their issues to make sure we're there. And the other part of the question is the innovation economy. And to me, you know, Fremont is such an educational-centric uh, area uh, with immigrants from China and India play such a high resilience and uh, a high reliance on education. We have a great elected school board that takes care of that. So I think it's our job is to make sure there's a job for them 
them at the end of the day because the other silver bullet in this innovation economy is a good paying job. Uh, and right now there's more people working at Tesla than when Numi left. Uh, we have success stories around Seagate, around Lamb, around Delta Electronics, about great companies expanding their presence in Fremont. Thank you, Bill. I, I did want to chime in because when I heard the response to the first part of the question from Bill, that is very refreshing because many a times we hear elected leaders sometimes frustrated that, oh, we are not hearing enough. You know, our community is not engaging. But the onus is upon the elected leaders to engage the community. It's not the latter. You know, the, the community will engage, but, you know, selectively. But if we have a serious burning issue in the community, it's for us to go out there and engage and get that dialogue. Now, what I've also heard on, in meetings, in, uh, in uh, you know, like city council meetings, for example, you hear of elected leaders looking at 200 people in the room and acknowledging that, okay, these 200 people have a voice here, but the 20,000 people or the 50,000 people that are not here, they have a bigger voice. Now, how flawed is that? Because these 200 people here have taken the time to represent themselves and talk about an issue. And why don't we acknowledge that, listen to it, and then take action based on that? So there are two parts to this story here, but the idea is very important to what, from what Bill is saying. You know, it's up, up to, the onus is upon the elected leaders to go out there and ensure that they are hearing the voice of the community. We'll keep going with Jim Davis. Well, thank you, uh, Rishi, for that. Uh, but what we also have to remember is the, the job of, uh, of government officials is a very strenuous one that uh, lasts all day and, and goes into the night. And many times, uh, well, friends of mine say, well, we'll have the weekend to do something. I say, no, I'm sorry, I've got several engagements that I've got to keep up. Uh, in my, my community, I serve on 15 different boards and commissions. I serve on the Association of Bay Area Government. I serve on Caltrans Modernization. I serve on Expressway Commission, Emergency Operations Council. So. I am doing as many things as I can to represent you and to, you know, get your, your views and your opinions uh, out there. The important thing that uh, we need to do outside of government is we need to give our economy a strong basis to continue to work on. Uh, as we saw in 2008, things can go bad and they can go bad in a big way real fast. So we need to be able to provide for uh, those entrepreneurs, those uh, companies in the tech field and others, uh, a place where they can uh, go and thrive and build. The other thing that we need to do is we need to encourage people to be, uh, participate. I have 16 different commissions that work in the city of Sunnyvale, from hou housing preservation, uh, landmark uh, heritage, the planning commission, the personnel board. These are all uh, positions that are available for our residents to come forward and become a little bit more engaged in government and find out more about how government works and where we, where we are in different situations and have input. And it also gives them the opportunity to build the knowledge and uh, that knowledge base that's necessary to step up to a position uh, such as a person on the city council, on the board of supervisors, uh, or God forbid, you know, uh, try to run for a state assembly. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, those are the challenges. Uh, everybody, the other thing that you know, is very important uh, that we have to recognize that everybody uh, has so many uh, pulls on their time. You know, the children have to go to school, to the after school experiences. They have to, uh, we have to go to work and make that money to pay the mortgage. Uh, and so we're pulled in a lot of different directions. But whatever you can do to engage yourself in our community is greatly appreciated. <laughs> so, um, once again, I, I think, um, and I appreciate Jim's comment and reminding me and others how much work we actually do to serve our community. I, too, serve on various commissions and boards, and, uh, and I'm fortunate enough that my wife is a co-partner in my service to the community. I've raised four sons in East Palo Alto. They're healthy, they're vibrant, they're off to colleges and universities, and oftentimes they're back home on the couch <laughs> uh, trying to grab something to eat. But when you look at, when I began thinking about East Palo Alto and their relationship with the tech industry and Silicon Valley, it, it really is a tale of two cities. Uh, we are not engaged in the tech movement. We're not, we're not receiving opportunities to work 
in the tech industry. We're not receiving opportunities to be service providers in the tech industry. San Mateo County has uh, one of the largest unemployment rates in the state of California, yet we in East Palo Alto continue to have the highest unemployment rate in San Mateo County. Uh, the city of Palo Alto is just acknowledged as having the fifth ranked educational system in the, 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 these United States. We in East Palo Alto are K through eight uh, Ravenswood City School District for 17 consecutive years has been on the list of 100 districts in the state for program improvement. Recently, we just had some uh, interviews for teachers. Uh, we interviewed 150 teachers for the Ravenswood City School District. Uh, and we are three weeks away from the opening of our school for the year, and we still are, lack about 12 teachers to fill those positions. Oftentimes, you know, the issues are various. One, the cost of living in, on the peninsula in the Bay Area is such that teachers cannot uh, afford to live unless they are they're really supported by the educational community and the banking systems. We struggle in these follow up to in, the, in those areas. I also want to want to highlight the fact that this, the tech industry has really created a burden on our community that we didn't foresee. Facebook is a quarter of a mile from my front door. Facebook made $4.2 billion the last quarter. Our general fund for a city is $24 million. We struggle with Facebook's movement into our area. They're incentivizing their employees to move closer to the Facebook campus by offering them a $10,000 right, cash uh, benefit. Well, coupled with that, where is the housing going to come from? They're pushing their way into the East Palo Alto community, and we are challenged um, unbelievably with this issue of gentrification. Gentrification for our community looks like three to four families merging together to make ends meet in a two-bedroom unit. So when we begin thinking about our, con our relationship with Silicon Valley, it's contentious. Right now, we have a water moratorium on the community of East Palo Alto. Why do you say moratorium? Because we have 13 projects entitled for development, but we don't have enough water to allow those projects to go forward. And we are looking to Silicon Valley to help us in that effort to identify additional water so we can put a shovel in the ground like every other community is doing in the valley today. So I'll just <coughs> end there. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to maybe expand on what uh, Vice Mayor was saying. Uh, a couple things, just to give a little historical context. Um, the city of Daly City, uh, when I first was elected, we led San Mateo County um, in foreclosures. Um, the unemployment rate throughout the county was, uh, was very, very high. Now it's at, it's throughout the state of California, according to the EDD rules, unemployment now is at about 3.3%. The issue um, in San Mateo County, the issue in San Mateo County, is that working now? Yep. The issue in San Mateo County um, pertains to, and if you look at some of the companies, it's, it's tremendous growth and it's exciting. So if you look on east of uh, 101, you have all the biotech. So you have Genentech, you have Amgen. As you begin to go up um, south down south to the county, you see other companies such as Oracle. Um, these are companies that are adding tremendous value. And they're adding value because they're employing people. They're adding value because in the city of South San Francisco, although I'm in the city of Daly City, um, it's about 45%, the biotech injury is about 45% of their, um, their general fund revenue. So these companies are adding tremendous value. And sometimes, because we live in the Bay Area, we, we, we fail to realize um, that this is one of the best places on earth to live. And some of the challenges that we have are because a lot of people from around the world and even in the United States, they want to come into this area. And so we need to, we need to recognize that. Um, I think um, Ash Kyra makes a good point around affordable housing. I think affordable housing in San Mateo uh, continues to be an issue. We like to follow the model that San Francisco and Santa Clara County is doing around an affordable housing bond. 
So these are all the issues um, that confront us. But let's, uh, let us not forget that the issues um, come from a good place. And a good place is our continued economic growth. And we should always stay focused on that. Thank you. Well, I uh, agree with uh, all the uh, the comments on uh, the panel about uh, how do we have economic growth that's uh, sustainable and inclusive and includes everyone. You know, I had a nephew uh, visiting uh, my my wife's nephew from Cleveland, and usually I thought, okay, we went to an A's game, and that that's what he'd want to do. And his the biggest thing he wanted to do is eleven years old is he wanted to get a tour of Facebook and a tour of Apple, a tour of Google. And you go there, and I, I had never really gone there from a, as a tourist perspective. You go there for meetings, and as everyone on the panel knows, to raise money because they call me the tech candidate. But uh, what you see is that uh, there's a fascination uh, around the nation with the opportunities and what Silicon Valley represents. And to me, the challenge, the challenge, and of course I defer to the vice mayor, but the challenge for in East Palo Alto and East San Jose and other areas is not just uh, how do we create opportunity now, but how do we get uh, people there the opportunities to work in uh, tech companies? Because when you go to Facebook, you don't see many black people there. You don't see many Latinos there. And part of it is challenging them to increase where they recruit. Not everyone has to be a Stanford graduate, though some of them should be Stanford graduates, but looking further for talent. Part of it is making sure people at a very young age, at uh, preschool or younger, uh, have the opportunities and don't fall behind with the opportunity gap. You know, by the age of five, a person's vocabulary, you can tell statistically whether they're going to go to college or not. So we lose this race very early on, and we have to invest in uh, expanding Head Start and universal preschool. And then we have to make uh, forms of college affordable, partly because if you go to places uh, for many families, people don't even think about college because they think I can't afford it. It's not something even on my horizon. And we have to prioritize California students for the California schools. So I think these are very difficult, complex issues that our region can have a make a contribution because if we don't, uh, we run the risk of having two societies, one where people have extraordinary opportunity to be part of a Silicon Valley that's changing the world and uh, others who are excluded. And it's all of our jobs to make sure everyone has uh, that equal opportunity. You know, your question on are we doing enough, can we be more engaged? Well, of course, the answer to that is yes, you can always do more. I think rather than talk about how the cup is half empty, I'd like to talk about how the cup is half full and what the state of California has done. As Roe mentioned, uh, uh, Head Start and preschool, we created this year, this is a historic year in the state of California. We created 9,000 new slots. We passed a measure, No Place Like Home, which is going to devote $2 billion with a B towards homelessness with people that are um, <clears throat> have mental health uh, uh, issues. We've kept our promise on the to the developmentally disabled community and funding $300 million for the, the, the disabled community. And let's not forget what's happening in, in – uh, uh, education, because I'm, you know, that, that old story, you know, the people running for school board will get up and say we're 49th in the nation. That's a lie. You know, we've invested over the last five years in the state of California, $3,600 per student. You know, we're in the 20s, as, as the state will go, and we've created n uh, uh, an additional 9,000 slots for the CSU and the UC, because we acknowledge that the need to educate our, our, our Californian. So that's, those are the things that, you know, maybe it doesn't make the front page of San Jose Mercury News, but they don't know who we are anyway. So, but those are important things that the state of California is doing because we, it's a progressive agenda. You, we live in this innovative, innovative economy and we want to do more. Um, I have a small little bill on ADUs. I'll talk to the panelists about, you know, a, a small answer to the housing problem. And, and, you know, I do want to acknowledge Lily, Lily is the only only female candidate on this panel here, and we are very happy that she is here joining us. And I have to, I have to tell you, you know, it, I've, I've had awkward situations when I walk into a meeting room 
and it's all female and I'm the only only male in the room, right? It's a little awkward for me. Now you step into uh, Lily's high heeled shoes and you can tell she's doing a phenomenal job. So let's give it up for Lily. Well, I don't, I don't think that um, for myself, I feel very awkward. I'm very pl um, honored just to be here and to represent um, the community as a whole. But when you asked the question earlier about the tech economy and dual economy and the falling below the poverty line, how can we do enough? And I know for myself as a working mom before in the technology and then my husband's a patent attorney, um, trying to run around and have two children, one who's in college and one who's in high school, and trying to get things done. For me, it's not just about um, how do we address this as politicians, but for, it's more of the way we live. And um, it's in this role, I have the privilege and honor to also serve as a bridge and bridging these relationships. I know that um, Mayor Harrison was earlier talking about our Fremont Festival of the Arts, and yesterday I spent half a day there. And one of the things when we talk about communication is how can we allow people to give us their feedback? And some of it is face-to-face, -face, and I was so surprised and very pleased to see that when we had different people coming to the booths, at times you think that you're not able to communicate. We had people who could speak all these different languages, even ASL. So allowing people to have that venue to be able to articulate and communicate with us their concerns and issues. Sometimes they are very positive and sometimes they're very negative, but it's important for us to be able to hear all their concerns. The other thing that we've strived to use is technology in our city. So having open city hall for people who can't come and if you're working two jobs, that you still have a voice in our city and you're able to provide us your feedback. Even something so simple as we have movies in the park and we had people allowing the children to make a vote on what type of movies they want to see so that we start at a very young age telling people that you make a difference. Your voice is important for us and we want to hear you. Um, the other th area that I've been very comfortable and challenging and engaging in is the private and public partnerships. We have to work very closely as entities in the city to be a bridge and to build those relationships to foster this awareness. Um, so whether it's a Silicon Valley leadership group, I've been to Ravenswood, and in particular we had Women Minority Leaders Day, and getting out there to talk about education, getting the community engaged, um, getting them involved in creating apps. We have students who do service learning hours, and it's not about just how do you do something for yourself, but how do you make that difference at the same time, not just for yourself, but for the community as a whole? So those are the things that I'm very pleased and honored to be involved with. Um, it's about how do we make sure the technology um, in the companies that we're looking at have the students and the resources that they need. And the more that I can work on in that area, um, the, the more I'm very pleased to see that the change is happening. Um, I really hope that we'll be in a city and in the community as we see in the moving forward that allows for us to be able to share that passion and that empowerment to not just better ourselves, but to better each other. And I think that when we work together um, as leaders, this is what we're going to see as the change in the next election. Thank you, Lily. Again, my, my perspective will be very different from what the other panelists have talked because I'm a just communist activist. I challenge the system. <laughs> so me, I've been working in the large corporations like Oracle, and now I work for Amazon. The, what we do every year end is a performance review, right? Uh, we have an application form. We fill up. They have 10 questions. We don't have that for the politicians today. We need to put together a performance review very transparent so that each and every citizen can see. I would like to know how many bills they have passed, how many jobs they have created, what healthcare improvements they have done, what transportation system, because I keep hearing Fremont has a problem, Cupertino has a problem, 237 has a problem, but what is the solution? I don't know. So I need to have a report after the end of the year, and what are the corruption charges? What are the people talking about on the wine? Hey, this guy has done this, he's done that. How can we improve this? This is the performance review I need to have for every politician in the Bay Area. Because this Silicon Valley, we need to make it transparent. That's one of the main things that we as uh, activists would like to see change. The second thing that I would like to say, I'm really surprised. Actually, I come from an Indian American background, as you know. We get 70% people voting there in the US, just 40 to 50% is great. That's bad. Actually, we need to make sure as a politician, as an activist, we need to up that number to 60 to 70%. Just because you don't like the politician and you don't go vote, that doesn't make sense. So I need to, we need to change that so that we can get a fair representation. People say, uh, 
it, it's you who elect. So if you don't go and vote, you may not get the right candidate there. That's the second thing. The third thing, which when Lily May was mentioned, they're going to the Wine and Art Festival, getting the survey, even Bill Harrison mentioned, uh, Mayor Bill Harrison mentioned. I think we need to, oh, that's one good thing, to do the town halls, but we need to have a, some high-tech uh, surveys put together by a third party, and who should be able to put that in the performance review. Saying that this is the survey, hey, what have you done about the survey? So I think we have many more activities that need to be done in the Silicon Valley to make the politicians more accountable and uh, be on par with the high-tech professionals. I think that would be the change that we can drive around the world. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you very much. I just want to tack into the performance review. Um, actually, there is a lot of uh, organizations and nonprofit or some special interests uh, a group that do ratings um, for for at, at least um, uh, at the state assembly level. So I, I guess uh, how can we get those information um, to the the voter? It, it is uh, a, a good good suggestion. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned about voting. Yes, um, how do we get people to involve um, in a two income family? Both Stacy and I we work. Um, more than one job in each one of us to get to where we are. I came here as a graduate student and be able to, to, to get to where we are. We did have to work you know, long hours. But there's still many opportunity, like many of the mayors, vice mayors have indicated for you to volunteer in the community. You know, voting is definitely the, the, the important, you know, we, um, only even on the uh, presidential election, we probably get about, uh, luckily, 60% of the re uh, eligible voters that will actually come out to vote. And in a non-presidential election like the 2014, we can only get about 30-some uh, uh, voter turnout. So, uh, you know, if you are a citizen and register to vote, and, and uh, exercise your your uh, power is definitely a, a, a good place to start. And you have kids, you know, there, there's a ample opportunity for you to volunteer in the school district, the PTAs and, and, and site council, so on and so forth. And actually, even if you not don't have enough time to uh, participate in the PTA, I would encourage you to show up in your class, uh, your kids' classroom. When I was a school board member, I started a program called Nas Dichos. That's the, it is for the uh, uh, Hispanic student, uh, Hispanic parents that doesn't speak much English, to go into the classroom and read this to the student a book in their in their mother tongue language, and that really empowered the, the student, make the stu the student feel. Uh, uh, very, very empowered because they have, uh, they heard their own mother tongue speaking in the classroom. So I'm just saying there's so many opportunity, and 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 just uh, take advantage of it. And we're in the the uh, high tech uh, center, epicenter. So uh, my comment about how we can uh, get more people involvement. We, I think we can definitely use some of the uh, technologies. You know, uh, I was talking about uh, the, the, the neighborhood association. I started, I, when I was at the council, we have uh, started many, many, about at least 12 neighborhood associations, but they don't have to meet on a regular basis after uh, work. They just have the Yahoo group, so we can use the media technology to get your neighbors all more connected. And, and like this, this is a, a panel with so many um, a, a, a distinguished uh, a panelists here. Uh, I would back the question, is, if this panel being video streamed, are can we be able to answer you know, questions on those people that don't, cannot make time to come to uh, uh, this beautiful theater on a Sunday afternoon, be also be able to hear what we have to say, or even asking questions. So take advantage of the, uh, the, the, the uh, 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 technology that we have in Silicon Valley. Thank you. I know I'm running out of time. I would, I would just, and on my next question, I'll, I would be real, real brief. 
So, so cancer, to answer your question, yes, we are doing Facebook Live. We are adopting technology. Facebook Live is streaming. Uh, but we don't have the interaction yet. We are waiting for Facebook to create that interaction component to that. But you know, I'll leave the mic right there. And I would like to ask Daisy a question. And that's our oh. final question for the panelist. Wow. And uh, the question is, response, huh? basically, it's about our voting record. And, and this is, you know, uh, I'll give you an example. When you look at, uh, when I look at the city of Saratoga, when I ran for council, you know, we, we are, our Indian American population is about 10% of Saratoga. So it's about 3,000 uh, residents. And when we look at high propensity voters, voters that have voted three out of five elections, that number, anyone wants to take a guess what the number is out of 3,000 Indian American population, what's the high propensity voter who have voted three out of five elections? 500. 500. 500. Anyone else? It's actually 145. Thank you, Yogi. Wow. Close. Wow. 145 vote on a high propensity basis. So that's that's a stark number. You know, that's the reality. What faces us? You know, in in terms of how, for a candidate, for an Indian American candidate to run for office, and if you are banking upon the Indian American vote, it's not going to happen, right? So you have to go mainstream with your ideas and policies, and th that's very helpful for us in positioning our candidacy. But beyond that, it actually represents what our Indian American community is not doing. We are not getting out there and, and voting. So now let me, let me. here is the other aspect of the stark reality. When there is a fundraiser, where there is a coffee social, we will show up, we will take pictures, we, will, we are very happy posting it on Facebook. <laughs> we are very happy about that. But we are not expressing our voice. And when our voice is not heard, people are not listening to us. So when the campaigns are out there, you know, I ran a campaign, and it was a r campaign r that was run based upon data analytics. You are targeting the high propensity voters. So if I do not vote, nobody is coming knocking on my door to talk to me. Nobody is listening to my voice. My voice is not heard. My voice is st stuck on Facebook. But nobody, none of the policymakers are listening to my voice because all I do is take pictures with uh, politicians, with celebrities, and we are putting it out there on the, on the social media. That's not helping our community. So we need to get out and vote. And uh, final words of wisdom from all of you in terms of you know, what, what is that one or two things you would like to see that would help encourage folks to get out there and vote. Some ideas that you have that might help with voter registration. And, and this totally, you know, completely your call in terms of how you want to position it. It could be your final words of wisdom, anything else. This will be only a minute long. So let's uh, stay on target because we are running out of time here. One minute uh, pitch on, in terms of all these different issues we talked about. All right. Thank you, Daisy. So Great. we'll, you, we'll you start with Daisy. short because I have taken all, most of your time. Yeah. Well, thanks for having, having me. I I'm a, agree with uh, Rashid. I just want to emphasize it again. Is it is extremely important to exercise your vote. Thank you. Yeah, that, was, that was short. And, and, and with my wife sitting next to me, I agree 100% of what she has said. You know, there is uh, behind a great man, there is a greater woman, and that's Daisy. <laughs> OK, how do you increase the voting, right? So every vo election is on a Tuesday. And when you have double-income families, they have to go to work. Can these powerful people make it a half a day? Or make sure the government passes a bill which says, you go and vote, and we will make sure your manager or whoever it is will give you a plus points. Some way, because in, Indian, in, in India, there's a demo, the big largest democracy, we get a day off to go and vote, not in the US. So some laws have to be changed so that people can go and vote. I think that's really key. That's a good point, and I would like to add that you know we do have, uh, you know, you can become a permanent absentee voter, and you can actually get the ballot in your home, and you can sitting in your dining table, opening up your laptop, researching candidates. I highly recommend doing that. You know, every every all of us have busy lives, and you will you will end up exercising your vote if you become a permanent absentee voter. That's the best way to get your voice out there. And Go thank you very much. I just wanted to add that. Uh, one of the bills that I'll be introducing next year is to ask the county register of voter to pay for the return stamp of your uh, absentee vote. So hopefully we'll, when we get it implemented, because it, it is, a, you know, I, I was, I, I'm a, a permanent absentee voter, and uh, every time I don't really know how much stamp that I need to put in on that return envelope because you know it's, it's probably exceed exceed the, uh, the weight of a, a normal uh, a letter. So we're going to make the ROV to pay for the return stamp. 
Fantastic. And, you know, in Santa Clara County, I think it happened in the last election where we did not have to use a stamp. I think it, it needs to happen all across California, all across the United States. Go on to Lily. I just want to add one to what Rishi was mentioning. Yes, we have absentee ballot votes. In reality, they go and drop it on the voting day in the mailboxes. That's what reality happens. If you look at the stats, that's what it shows. So if they get some time off or some kind of a flexibility, I think that would improve. Thank you. So in one minute, I think when the students turn 18, it should be standard where we provide the students the registration to vote. And then when they're voting, then they'll also have that discussion at home and encourage their families to vote. So I think that empowering our youth, and which is a discussion that I know you're having throughout this forum, but getting them to vote and getting their families to have that discussion will change the interaction and involvement of their families. That's a good radical idea. Uh, probably more early voting spots and also mobile voting spots. So you would go to a movie theater and you'd have, you know, the county registrar will be there and you can come up and you can vote then. It's mind-boggling, those candidates here, the amount, those early uh, permanent absentee ballot individuals who let that ballot sit there for 30 days and never mail it in. It's not a matter of the stamp. They just don't. They're, you would think that they'd get 100% because they had 30 days in order to vote. So I think we have to go to the people. I think the uh, statistics uh, aren't quite as bleak uh, as, as Rishi, I mean, I, uh, as uh, they may have been. In this primary election, which we, of course, won, there were 20,000 uh, eligible South Asians in Congressional District 17, and uh, 12,600 actually turned up to vote, 60%. Partly that's because of uh, Rina and Mahesh and Chandraji Yogi's efforts at mobilizing uh, the community, uh, making phone calls, going door to door, talking to people. Uh, I predict that we will see 18,000 uh, South Asians turn out in the November election at around probably 70%. And I think it will be uh, at the rate, if not higher, than uh, the other populations. If you study the primary uh, campaign turnout, the South Asian community's turnout was actually higher uh, than any other community except for the Vietnamese community, which turns out at 82%. So I think we're making extraordinary progress, and I'm very confident that uh, we'll continue to be uh, empowered. That's, that's an eye-popping data. You know, thank you for sharing that, Drew. And I did want to make a comment here. You know, we have a very young uh, Secretary of State, Alex Padilla, and basically he's turned the voter registration as part of the whole DMV process, right? So I think we can innovate. We can innovate. There are lots of ideas been shared here, and we should very closely we listen very closely because some of these could actually become a policy in California and then across the United States. I would just say um, language access is, is, is critical, making sure that ballots are, um, ballot statements are available. Um, in different people's languages. And I think the um, something that's a little bit radical, uh, Rishi, but is looking at maybe um, lowering the voter threshold um, to maybe 16-year-olds being able to vote, um, something to, to consider. And I think the third thing, and I'll just close with this, it's called personal accountability. Uh, we want to encourage everyone to vote, but you're responsible, and if you can vote and you register to vote, then you should, um, you should vote. It's your choice. Thank you. Um, you know, I've actually heard some great ideas here from the other panelists, and I'm looking forward to maybe learning more and trying to incorporate some of these ideas and concepts in East Palo Alto and certainly in San Mateo County. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind for me, though, is we have to, I believe, create more opportunities for our young uh, people, our teenagers and our young adults to lead discussions around politics, to create forums where they're providing the leadership, where they're facilitating the discussion. And in doing so, I think what you will find, uh, what I found in my campaigns is that young people are more apt and more willing to walk the neighborhoods and use those young legs to knock on doors and to share the message. If we will allow them a portion of leadership as it relates to the various topics that need to be addressed in the community. So, and then part of that means to uh, facilitate getting facilities for them, the equipment necessary to help them with the promotion and the advertisement of those endeavors so they can not only attract uh, their peer groups, but they can also bring in uh, some of the more mature voters in the uh, community. <coughs> I'll give you the biggest incentive uh, that we can give to a voter. 
I have the authority to spend $150 million of your money. So, you know, if you're not, if you're not, you don't care about that, then don't come out and find it out about me or my opponent or any of the other council members or any of the people, people uh, sitting at the table. But if that means something to you, you know, because that is where your representative democracy really hits the uh, road, you need to get out and you need to vote. And it's not by giving you a day off or a dollar for uh, your little voter tab. It's you know, for making sure that you know the community that you want is the community that is represented. Thank you. <clears throat> and since this is the last question, I'll say thank you again to the organizers for bringing us together for a great discussion. So let's give them a round of applause. I'm fortunate to have two of my state representatives sitting here, so I will put the plug out. The city of Fremont, along with other cities, have uh, asked a uh, state legislator to look at uh, vote by mail exclusively on some elections. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the results up in Oregon, it's been phenomenal with increasing the turnout, especially if a city is forced to do a special election. To not have the expense of all the polling places and to go to a strictly vote by mail will save the city money as well as uh, allow greater uh, voter access to uh, people actually voting. It's, it's no longer election day, it's election month, and I think the more and more we can do to have people have that conversation at the Rishi's uh, dining room table about the voters, I think, I think we'll be better off. So let's go look, look at going to a vote by mail system and look, look by taking uh, the information to the people. Thank you. Thank you. thank you everybody for being here, uh, the panelists, thank you Rishi um, for the great questions, for moderating. And um, I, you know, everyone came up with really great suggestions, which I agree with in terms of empowerment, in terms of accessibility, in terms of increasing voter registration and participation. I think ultimately, if you want people to vote more, you have to give them something to vote for. And I think with the, the flood of money in politics, you have all these super PACs and all this negative campaigning, I think it's really turning people off. I think it keeps people from voting. Uh, I, even though there might be increases during presidential years, you'll see dips during gubernatorial elections, and there might be individual you know, efforts where we you know, try to get out the vote, or uh, there might be a certain attraction to an individual candidate. At the end of the day, you're seeing more and more negativity and more and more money coming in. I think people are getting the sense, and in some cases they're right, uh, the sense of their vote doesn't matter. And I think the more that we allow that to happen, uh, I think that we're gonna continue to struggle no matter how, whether, even if we do automatic registration and what have you, it doesn't mean people are gonna actually gonna exercise their right or actually become educated, even if they end up voting because someone persuades them to vote. We want educated voters, but we, I think we have to start by having more positivity uh, in the electoral process. What about having uh, uh, paper ballots and having the count done in public where people can see a transparent vote count? Yes, so I think I think we're talking about transparency of voting, and that's an important question too. But we are out of time here, so this is the final word, right? I get to I, I get to make the final word here, and and the 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 you know we this is politics is the world of glamour, is that right? These these folks here they are pretty glamorous, but politics is not. It's not the world of glamour. It's about rolling up your sleeves and getting out there and working. It's a thankless job. We will not be surprised that we will always see bricks being thrown at us compared to bouquets. You know, we, we have to get used to that as political leaders. And that's the phenomenal job that the folks sitting on this panel do do that, right? They do it day in and day out. They extend their time, they barely sleep, and they're out there working in the community. We heard multiple perspectives from all of them. You know, we heard from Roe, you know, how 12,000 out of 20,000 Indian, Indian Americans got out there and voted. We heard from Bill Harrison, from Mayor Bill Harrison, in terms of all the work he's been doing in the community about his outreach in reaching out there and getting them involved, getting them engaged. You know, there's a tremendous opportunity. We, we heard from Jim Davis talking about all the amount of money that is waiting to be spent. And if we don't engage, all that money is gone, poof, disappeared, it's there, it's been spent, but we don't have a say in that. You know, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity for us to engage. It is a tremendous opportunity. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, the learnings are tremendous. Sometimes it's all about going out there and working on a simple school district issue because we, we value education so much. You know, that's a starting point sometimes that could snowball very quickly. You know, many of us are geeky. Uh, you know, I call myself, I'm a geeky mechanical engineer, you know. And I, I very, very geeky to the core of my heart, but at the same time, what I've learned 
all the things I've learned, the skill of going out there in public and talking or interacting with people that has actually played out well in my corporate job as well has come from community service because when you get out there and when you have good intentions of making something good happen, when you're pure of heart and you're trying to get involved, not knowing what the result would be, the outcome is phenomenal because you're not only helping out the community, but more importantly, you are going through a personal transformation yourself. When you go out there and spend time on a cause, the rewards are amazing in terms of the return that comes to us, even though you did not quite start off with that perspective. The returns are tremendous. So my take on this, the final take is, let's get involved, let's engage in the community, let's get out there and showcase our good intentions, the energy that we have in making something good happen. We have some phenomenal leaders to follow. We have Martin Luther King, we have uh, uh, activist Chavez, we have Mahatma Gandhi, we have so many phenomenal leaders that have showcased how exactly to be in the path of community service. Let's get out there, make something happen, and the rewards will come back to us. So once again, a big round of applause to our amazing panelists.